Hello! Welcome to a new video. I am kind of excited to be starting on this bodice. It's like... It's like this thing's coming to an end. Honestly, yeah! Like... Yeah. When I made my Ravenclaw dress last year, I talked about the patterning of the two extant examples in the Eleanor de Toledo burial gown and the Crimson Pisa gown and how similar they are. If you want to hear more about that, I'll link that video in the description. For this project, I used the Toledo burial gown pattern, but I altered the arm size so the seam was more under the arm than a true side back. I did do some light pad stitching in the center front of the interlining to give it some structure, but the footage of it was lost in the great memory card wipe, never to be seen from again. But just know it's there, because structure is important. Then, to avoid another mild panic attack over fraying fabric, I don't know how to do this and make it invisible. Why didn't I just bagline this? I sewed small scrap pieces of fabric in the corners of the neckline. I used pins to mark the seam lines and tried my best to keep the seam allowances even. This is a technique I picked up from watching copious amounts of videos about sewing couture evening wear. And then I clipped the corners, turned, and pinned the fabric. I wasn't worried about the scraps showing at all because they would be hidden underneath the lining. Once all the edges were pinned to the interlining, it was time to sew the fashion layer down. I like to do this with a running stitch, others prefer a herringbone stitch. As long as the fabric is secure, it really does not matter. I also made sure to miter the corners as neatly as possible. This not only reduces bulk, but also makes the inside look fabulous. After the fashion layer is secure, it's time to put in the lining. I prefer to do this before I join the shoulder seams because the pieces are more manageable. I didn't treat the neckline of the lining the same way that I did the fashion fabric because I wasn't worried about the lining fraying. Lots of smoothing, folding, and pinning later, I filled the lining into the bodice. A prick stitch is the more historically accurate stitch to use here, but I'm faster at felling, so felling it was. At this point, I couldn't resist to see how the bodice looked on the form. It's not perfect, but seeing it together made me excited. When I join the shoulders, I always make sure to line up the interlining of the bodice and stitch right next to it. I don't want any extra bulk in the seams caused from sewing over the interlining, but I also don't want the shoulders to be different lengths. Once I was happy with where it was, I pinned it together and sewed the shoulders with the machine. The next step was to place the guards. I knew I wanted to copy the placement from the Crimson Pizza dress, which consisted of two bands across the back and the traditional placement on the front. I carefully pinned the guards in place, making the miters as clean as possible. Then I was on to hours of felling, which I chose to do outside so I could listen to the birds. One awkward try-on and 40 hand-bound eyelids later, it was time to wait for my fitting party with my friend Casey. The bodice. Okay. So when we put on the bodice, um, it was too tight in the arm size, but it should be a really easy fix. Um, I'll just have to take apart the arm size and lower them so they're at... Um, just one eyelet down. It'll give me a half inch extra room. Well, really nicely. Um, where I want it to. I remember making this alteration before I'd sewn the whole thing together when I made my silver Ravenclaw dress, but for some reason it just didn't click in my head that it needed to be a thing for this dress as well. Altering the arms eye was easier than I expected. Um, I wanted to make sure that everything came out symmetrical, so I measured and marked where I wanted to cut before clipping, folding, and reshaping the fashion layer and lining. In the end, it doesn't look much different than if I had made the arms eye correctly to begin with. 
All right, so I just put everything on my dress form and I'm actually really happy with it. There are just some things that I need to fix. These guards, I feel like are also a little bit too thin and not in proportion with the rest of the dress, which has these four inch guards. Um, so I'm gonna take these one inch guards and turn them into two inch guards. This means taking off hours of felling. Before I got started putting the guards back on though, I repurposed the existing guards as boning channels. When we did the fitting, the bottom half of the bodice kept wanting to flip up, which meant that the pad stitching in the interlining was not enough structure. Good thing it's easily fixed with boning! I placed the channels behind the guards and machine sewed them into place. You know, for added stability. I used cable ties as boning because it's what I had on hand. I made sure to round out the edges with my scissors so they will not rub through the channels. Once all the bones were cut to size, it was time to replace the guards, but with an increased width. The fact that they were cut on the straight grain instead of the bias meant that I had issues. The guards refused to lay flat on the curve without the neckline, so I ended up using my iron to shape the guards. It's not perfect, but it worked. Then it was back to pinning and felling the guards back on. Oh, I do really love how this bodice turned out. Um, I learned a lot in the making of my Ravenclaw dress that kind of just transferred over and this one is honestly better. Like, I learned and I grew and it was great. Anyway. I will see you guys all next week for a new video, and I'll catch you live on Thursday. Bye, guys.